thank you so much for coming tonight and thank you for putting those comments keep them coming in um we've got a fantastic talk for you tonight um we really want to say a massive thank you to adidas 510 for all of the things they do to support us in um bringing this series of talks together um the whole series has been evolving and we've been putting all sorts of different talks on so if this is your first one please check out our youtube channel because there's loads of things you've missed uh, go check them out tonight's is going to be really special and rebecca's going to tell us all about that now Fantastic. Well, we're really, really pleased to welcome Dr. Sharda Ellison tonight. And um, this this was the sort of thing where we, we were talking to Rebecca Dent and she said, oh, have you ever had a sleep expert? And we thought, no, what a fantastic thing. Um, and so she's recommended Charlotte and we're just really lucky that she's able to join us. Um, as we've been sort of focusing on in, in recent webinars, we're really trying to look at putting some science and research behind things and find specialists who, who really understand that as well as a, sort of having a, an idea of the difference between a particular thing in women and in men and the experience of that. So Charlotte has um, a background in lab-based sleep studies um, and has also done lots of academic research she's worked with a huge number of athletes across different disciplines and is just really passionate about explaining how to have good quality sleep and talking about how that can affect athletic performance um, so without any further ado i'm going to get rid of me and emma and hand over to charlotte <laughs> Hi there, everybody. Thank you so much for that really kind uh, introduction. I'm really excited to be here talking to you tonight. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Please do put your questions as we're going along. Please do put your questions into the chat box. We're going to have time for about 15, 20 minutes, probably about 15 minutes of questions um, at the end. So as I'm talking, as you're thinking, please pop your questions in there and I will aim to answer as many as I possibly can at the end of the session. Um, I uh, forgive me for looking kind of what looks like above you. I've got several screens here, so I'm looking what looks like above you, but I am looking at you. Um, and please, I hope you do enjoy this session. So as Rebecca said, I'm a researcher, I'm a clinician. I've spent the past 15 years now working in sleep research, uh, both in a research capacity, uh, looking at the effect of sleep deprivation on um, elite athletes, endurance athletes, uh, lots of different types of athletes. Um, but I also work clinically, working with people who have sleep disorders, uh, people who just don't sleep very well. I've got a clinic in Chamonix, I live out in Chamonix, so I've got a clinic in Chamonix where I diagnose, treat and assess people with sleep disorders. So I've got a big, wide range of background in, in all aspects of sleep. And tonight, I hope we're going to talk about what is sleep, uh, what makes us sleep, why do we sleep and uh, how does poor sleep or disturbed sleep impact our cognitive and physical performance. So let's get started. So we all need, know that sleep is vital to life. You will survive longer without food or water than you will without sleep. And when we used to, when we used to ask the question, what is sleep? Or when people used to ask me that question, what is sleep or why do we sleep? Or what is sleep good for? The crass answer would be, well, we sleep to cure sleepiness or we sleep because we get sleepy. But in reality, it's a really stupid answer. You know, it's like saying that we eat to cure hunger and it tells us nothing about the nutritional benefit of food. So now based on the kind of the weight of the evidence, if you like, we've kind of upended that question. And we now ask, is there any process in your body or any operation kind of of your mind that isn't hugely enhanced when you get sleep or significantly impaired when you don't get enough sleep? And the answer is no. So in response to that question, why do we need sleep or what is sleep? Sleep, essentially, think of it as your life support system. It is Mother Nature's best attempt at immortality and sleep. I, like, I liken it to like the Swiss Army knife of health. I think no matter what your ailment is, sleep has a tool in its toolbox that can probably help out with. So although technically we don't really know the answer to why do we sleep, we do know a lot regarding some of the physiological mechanisms that happen to make you want to sleep. And we know some really interesting things about what happens in your body throughout the day to prepare you for sleep. Um, even though we kind of still can't really answer that most simplest of questions. You know, if we look at sleep from an evolutionary perspective, it would appear to be almost completely incompatible with survival because it prevents feeding 
and procreation and could expose the sleeper to attack by predators. So sleep must confer some essential benefits to outweigh those serious disadvantages. You know, if sleep doesn't serve a vital function, then it really is the biggest mistake the evolutionary process ever made. More recently, scientists have argued that sleep is involved in helping our bodies to recover from the stresses and strains of the day. We've all heard that, I'm sure. And it's, you know, it gives us time for our brains to process the experiences of the previous 12 hours and to prepare for the day ahead. Um, so when we kind of move on to that question, what is sleep? Well, and, and kind of what is the importance of sleep? Well, today, I just really want you to take away the importance of sleep. There is so much that I could cover tonight and it's really difficult. So I suspect we'll end up doing more sessions, but, but I want you to understand the importance of sleep, why we need it and what happens when we don't get it. So if just kind of think to yourselves for a moment, how many people here, how many of you, and I've seen some great um, responses to the questions that, um, the question that Rebecca kindly sent out. So I've already seen a little bit of a snapshot of how some of you sleep or how some of you don't sleep. But how many of you here would consider yourselves to be a bad sleeper? Or how many of you would know somebody who would consider themselves a bad sleeper? You know, uh, I know there's not everyone here is, uh, is in the UK at the moment, but as British people, the Brits tend to talk about two things. One is the weather and the second is how well we did or did not sleep. I can assure you of that. You know, I spent, I spent years terrorizing my brother with my nighttime wakening. I was often found at university with cutlery in my bed or with grass on my feet, having been wandering around the garden. Thankfully, I've grown out of that now. And I'm not telling you that because it's the profound moment I decided to work in sleep, far from it. But it's to emphasise how common sleep disorders are and sleep problems are. In the UK population, we estimate 46% of people are snorers. 26% of people have some form of obstructive sleep apnea. We know about 33% of the population has some kind of sleep disturbance that results in excessive daytime fatigue. And 6% of the population suffer from some form of insomnia. As a society, we are chronically sleep deprived, but we don't seem to do anything about it. You know, sleep disturbances are so, so common. If you had a sore tooth, you would go to the dentist. If you had a sore knee, you'd go off to the physio. <coughs> but, you know, it, it, we all know someone who's been a bad, says they've been a bad sleeper. I've been a bad sleeper for years. Well, if you've been bad sleeping badly for years, then it's very likely there's a reason for it. And it has never been easier to go and get some help, go and see somebody about your sleep. Sleep is a process of recovery for the body and mind. We've already touched on that. It's the single most important neurobehavioral and neurobiological event that occurs in our day-to-day -day life. It's the time our body and mind recovers, we consolidate memories, and we prepare for that day ahead. I often get asked, how much sleep do I need? You know, how many hours should we be getting? The National Sleep Foundation recommends an average of eight hours sleep per night for good cognitive function. That's fine, but obviously we're all different. We all need different amounts of sleep. We all have different genetic propensities to sleep. Um, you know, to put it in context, our sleep lab, that's kind of laboratory I work in, if you were getting consistently six hours or less sleep per night, we would deem you chronically sleep deprived. And we would be expect you to be demonstrating physical, cognitive and hormonal uh, impairments related to that. You know, sleep is so important to our physical and mental well-being. Yet, you know, we've said sleep curtailment is just an absolute hallmark of modern society. Until recently, we haven't deemed time asleep as an effective use of our time. We aren't working, eating, socialising or being productive or so we think. And sleep is really kind of what we've done when we had time. <coughs> Sorry. We know um, Margaret Thatcher famously said sleep is for wimps um, and famously slept for three to four hours a night throughout her whole kind of political career. Hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll realise that how wrong she was. You know, I think surviving on a few hours sleep is like a bit of a badge of honour. I often see people coming into my laboratory absolutely adamant that they can happily survive on four or five hours sleep per night. It's just, it's just absolutely not possible. And hopefully today we'll realize that. You know, I think we know that we're all starting to realize that sleep really underpins all our other behaviors. You know, how many times have you had a bad night's sleep and been in a bad mood the next day or eaten 
junk food the next day or been able to unable to concentrate in a meeting you know sleep underpins all the other behaviors that we require for good cognitive function for good nutrition for good training for giving us the motivation to train for give us the capacity to train it underpins all of that so you know today i can't give you uh, the answers to some great philosoph philosophical questions surrounding sleep but let's try and perhaps better understand why it's so important so before we do that, we're going to move on to a little bit of science, a bit of uh, apologies for this, for those who don't want a bit of science, but we have to understand the mechanisms that make us sleep before we can really understand what impacts our sleep. So we're just going to talk really as quickly as I can about the two mechanisms that make us go to sleep at night, one of which will be quite familiar to you and the other of which probably a little bit less so. So what makes us go to sleep? So like body temperature or blood sugar, sleep is regulated internally. So for instance, when our body temperature falls, blood vessels constrict and we shiver. When blood sugar levels rise, the pancreas secretes insulin. And when we remain awake for an extended period of time, we have structures in the brain that promote sleep and make us sleepy and make us want to go to sleep. So there are two main mechanisms that control our need to sleep. One you will have definitely heard of, we'll touch on that in a moment, but the, the first one I want to touch on is something called homeostatic sleep pressure, or your sleep drive, or your pressure to sleep, your drive to sleep, it's called lots of different things, and perhaps you have or haven't heard of it. But this drive operates on a very simple deprivation and satisfaction model. The longer you go without sleep, the sleepier you get as that internal pressure builds up. During the day, we've got lots of chemicals that build up and up and up in our brain. Uh, the most important being adenosine. So remember that for later. And this, these kind of chemicals increase our pressure to sleep. When we cannot no longer stand the pressure of those chemicals, specifically that chemical adenosine, we fall asleep. Sleeping then dissipates our sleep pressure and then we start the next day afresh. And so this is the main reason that napping works. When we have a nap that we're kind of building up that chemical adenosine, if we have a nap, we dissipate a little bit of that, that chemical and then we start off afresh. And that's, that's how uh, napping works. You know, I always liken uh, being awake as like low, le low level brain damage. You know, throughout the day, from the minute we wake up in the morning, we are building neurotoxic metabolic waste that is kind of there in our, in our brains. And so it builds up and up and we need to dissipate a bit of that chemical. It's a very simple and effective mechanism. But homeostatic sleep drive is not the only mechanism involved in regulating sleep and wake. If it were, catnapping throughout the day would be the norm rather than the exception. You know, after a few hours of wake, we might nod off for an hour, then rise again, you know, only to fall asleep again just a few hours later. But actually, most of us remain awake and alert for 16 hours plus um, each day. And despite the fact that our sleep drive, this pressure to sleep increases with every hour of wakefulness, we're typically no sleeper at sleepy uh, at 8 p.m. than we are at 3 p.m. So what else is involved? Something else has to be involved. And interestingly, the sleep drive is absolutely dependent on kind of the amount of preceding sleep or wake that we've had. So if we didn't have any sleep over one night, the next night and the next day, we'd be really, really tired because that 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 chemical won't have been dissipated and that build up will be exponentially much larger. But what else is involved? There has to be something else involved. So in combination with our process S, which is our sleep drive, it's what we call sleep drive, is our process C. So you'll have all, all heard of process C, it's our circadian rhythm, your biological clock. The body's built-in circadian clock is centered in your, it's in your supercosmic nucleus in the, at the back of your head. And it's the main mechanism that controls the timing of sleep. And it's absolutely independent of the amount of preceding sleep or wakefulness. So this internal clock is controlled by the presence and absence of light over a 24 hour period. It regulates the body's sleep patterns, feeding patterns, core body temperature, brainwave activity, cell regeneration, hormone production, almost all of your bio biological activities are regulated by your circadian rhythm. So in short, it regulates all the processes that affect your degree of alertness um, at various times throughout the day. You know, for the past 50,000 years, our biological clocks have absolutely ruled our lives. Our ancestors rose and ate and hunted and gathered and socialized and rested and healed on perfect biotime. We rose with the sun, spent most of the day outdoors and slept in perfect darkness. 
but then we've evolved and we've created societies and, and you know amazing advances that have ironically turned that kind of finely tuned and evolved inner clock against us you know i think it's taken about 125 years to undo 50,000 years of perfect bio timekeeping i think evolutionary anthropologists will all agree that that one of the most disruptive events in our evolutionary history and and that kind of history of bio time occurred when we electrified society you know that the invention of the electric light bulb has done nothing to help our sleep so everyone has this master biological clock ticking away inside our brain which is our circadian rhythm but unlike a normal clock not everybody's biological clock keeps to the same time or to the same pace so as i've already said we all have a different genetic propensity to sleep so i said earlier you know the, the national sleep foundation will say we need eight hours for good cognitive function we would say between seven and nine hours is ideally what we need for good sleep or for good cognitive function. We know now, we know there's reams of research to, to kind of demonstrate this, but certainly in our laboratory, we see that if you are consistently sleeping for less than seven hours per night over a long period of time, I know now that we could bring you into our laboratory and we would see cognitive and physical impairment um, through objective measurements. So we would be able to test you and we would see some kind of deficits due to that lack of sleep. And that's just less than seven hours a night. So for the rest of this kind of discussion, I'm going to talk, when I'm talking about disrupted sleep, disturbed sleep, a lack of sleep, I'm really referring to six and a half hours or less per night, just kind of for the absence of doubt. So what does good sleep look like? Well, firstly, we need those two processes to work in synchrony. We need those two processes, your circadian rhythm and your sleep drive to work in perfect harmony for us to sleep well. One cannot work without the other, but there is so much in modern life that's interfering with those processes and it's interfering with those kind of powerful day-to-day -day environmental external stimuli that impact whether we sleep well or not. Um, so what does good sleep look like? I'm gonna to briefly touch on that because we need to know what should our sleep be looking like? We all probably know that we sleep in cycles. We sleep in sleep cycles. A sleep cycle is roughly 90 minutes. We're all a bit different, um, but a cycle is about 90 minutes. So we pass through four to five of those cycles per night. What's interesting about those? Well, the cycles are, are divided into two different types of sleep. We have REM sleep and non-REM sleep. Non-REM sleep is thereby also kind of divided into further stages, imaginatively called stage one, two, three, and four. And a complete sleep cycle takes about 90 minutes. But what's interesting and why we talk about the fact that quality, quantity is as important as quality is that the proportions of those, the time spent in those phases of sleep changes throughout the night. So stage one sleep is your light sleep where you're drifting in and out. It's your nodding dog where you're kind of nodding and falling, falling asleep. You can be awakened very easily. In this stage, your eyes are moving slowly, your muscle activity slows, and lots of people experience sudden muscle contractions, which will kind of wake you up. I'm sure you've all experienced that on a plane or, you know, sleeping in a tent or in a crag or somewhere. Stage two, we then pass into this, this second stage of sleep lasts about 20 minutes. We then pass into stage three. We have very deep, slow brain, brain waves known as delta waves begin to emerge during this stage. And it's a transitional period between light sleep and very deep sleep. We then pass into stage four. This is referred to as delta sleep or slow wave sleep. And it's incredibly deep, deep sleep. And it lasts for about 30 minutes in those initial cycles. And this is typically where sleep bedwetting, sleepwalking occurs at the end of stage four. And it's very difficult to wake someone up in stage four sleep. We then pass into stage, uh, stage five sleep or REM sleep. So this is probably the most well-known stage of our sleep. It's your rapid eye movement sleep, a uh, rapid eye movement. It's characterized by eye movement, um, increased respiration, increased brain activity. REM sleep is also referred to as paradoxical sleep because while the brain and other body systems become more active, your muscles become more relaxed or actually paralyzed. Your voluntary muscles become kind of paralyzed. And dreaming occurs because of increased kind of brain activity, but voluntary muscles become paralyzed. And that's a protective mechanism. It's to stop you doing what I did when I was younger. It's to stop you from harming yourself, from leaping out of bed and acting out your dreams. Um, 
what's important about brain about REM sleep why is it important that we spend all of our time and we get good quantity of sleep to enable us to pass through these phases is that you know during REM sleep it's when we have this cerebral flushing uh, mechanism we know that our cerebral spinal fluid flushes through the brain and actually manages to get rid of a lot of that kind of metabolic waste that we don't want and that's built up kind of throughout the daytime so REM is really important um, and that's kind of, and we know, we know that over a seven hour period, we pass through four to five cycles of sleep. So quantity, really, really important. I normally touch on how does a lack of sleep affect us? How does it affect us? I'm not going to touch on it too much tonight because I think too many people spend a lot of time listening to the kind of really depressing stats about how bad sleep is going to make us live a much shorter life and it all becomes a little bit depressing. But what we do know is that the, the impact of poor sleep is quite profound. Perhaps hormonally and physically are the, are the impacts that we're probably a little bit less aware of, they're much more chronic, they're the impact that we're not aware of. You know, cognitively, we're much more aware of the acute impact of poor sleep. We've all experienced having a bad night's sleep and then just not being able to function the next day, being in a bad mood, you know, having our cognitive uh, function being really, really impacted. But physically, we know, we know now that there is so much, so much, there's such a huge link between the physical impact of, and poor and disturbed sleep. The World Health Organization has just declared shift work as a probable carcinogenic. And to just give you, to, 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 to just demonstrate how sensitive we are to poor sleep. We know that there is a global annual experiment that includes over a billion people in over 70 countries that happens twice a year, that is called daylight saving. We know that each spring when we lose an hour in the month following the clocks changing, the incidence of cardiac um, events, so heart attacks, goes up by roughly 26%. We know similarly in the autumn now the converse happens and we see a reduction in cardiac events by 21%. We, this just goes some way to demonstrate how sensitive our bodies are to a change in sleep and a disruption in our sleep. So hormonally, I'll touch on it very, very quickly, the hormonal impact of poor sleep. Uh, perhaps the two most kind of interesting uh, hormonal impacts are our hunger hormones. We know now that if our sleep is disrupted, we're not getting enough sleep, we are sleep deprived. The the kind of balance between our two hunger hormones, leptin and ghrelin, so one of those hormones controls our hunger, the other controls our satiety. We know that that balance gets completely thrown out of whack. So when we are sleep deprived, and I'm talking one night of sleep deprivation, we know the hormone that controls our satiety, our feeling full, um, reduces massively, so we don't feel full. And we know that our hunger hormone, the hormone that, in, that, that kind of promotes our, our feeling hunger, massively increases it's why when we've had a bad night's sleep the next day we want to eat more we reach for the probably the worst foods we don't feel as full so we keep eating and we always feel hungry if we're feeling a little bit hungover or we've had a bad night with a baby or we've been working all night whatever it is we it changes the way we eat uh, there's been some recent work looking at the fact that if you are surviving on five and a half hours sleep per night consistently we know that that means that you will be eating about 300 calories extra per day, which equates to about 70,000 calories uh, per year, which equates to about 10 to 15 pounds of obese mass. So we know that a lack of sleep has an extraordinarily strong obesogenic profile. Um, the other hormone that's hugely impacted, and I just haven't got the time to go into it, it's another session, is cortisol. It's our stress hormone. We know if we're sleep deprived, we have a huge increase in our, the levels of our kind of baseline cortisol. From the minute we wake up in the morning, we have that should be the moment where we have our highest level of cortisol kind of coursing around the body. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, cortisol, our stress hormone gets us up in the morning. It gets us moving. It makes us perform at work. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But in an ideal world, our cortisol profile reduces by the time we go to bed. So just pre-bedtime, we want to have a nice low cortisol level, a low stress level, which then uh, helps to initiate and maintain good sleep. When we're sleep deprived, we have much, much elevated cortisol levels. And that really become, becomes that makes things a little bit difficult when we're trying to sleep. So 
the hormonal impact. We won't go too much deeper into it for now. <coughs> so the cognitive impact of poor sleep, we've touched on it. We are all so aware um, of this acute impact of poor sleep. Whilst the hormonal and physical implications are perhaps not so obvious because they're much more long term and kind of chronic, the cognitive impact of poor sleep is glaringly obvious. I don't doubt for a minute we've all experienced that lack of concentration the morning after the night before or the kind of debilitating effect a new baby has on your tiredness levels, your concentration levels, your decision making, your reaction times. And I often say to people, certainly in terms of cognition and wondering whether you are sleep deprived, are you getting enough sleep or not? Mood. Mood is the biggest quick indicator of how sleep deprived you are. Your subjective sense of how well you are doing is a miserable predictor of objectively how you're doing. So to kind of put that in context, it's a little bit like someone being at a bar, having had one or two too many drinks, but thinking they can drive home and being absolutely adamant they can drive home, they can't. And it's the same with being with sleep deprivation. We are not aware of kind of how poor our cognitive function is when we are sleep deprived. And that's a, 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 that has serious implications when we talk about physical performance in terms of sport, which we'll touch on in a few minutes. So that cognitive impact, we know that good sleep imp improves concentration, attention, decision-making, creativity, our social skills. And we know that poor sleep really negatively affects our mood, our stress levels, our impulsiveness, our anger levels, our social skills, all of those are really impacted. But, but what does, what do we find in day-to-day -day life? What are those external influences that actually impact our sleep? Well, we kind of divide them into lots of different, into four different main categories in, in our clinic um, and in kind of sleep science and sleep medicine. We look at lifestyle factors. We look at behavioral factors. We look at nutritional factors. And if we can't manage sleep with any of those three factors, that's when we will then move on and look at sleep disorders. So again, I already said this, if you or someone you know has slept poorly or been a bad sleeper for years and years and years, it, it, that's when we would start looking at sleep disorders. Our sleep disorders kind of at play there. So what are some of the things that can impact of our sleep? And so this is, I'm really going to touch on some of those sleep hygiene issues that we are all so painfully aware of, but perhaps we don't understand the science underpinning those. So physical activity, look, we're all guilty of this. I know this is an audience of very sporty women, uh, very fit women who like to exercise a lot, I'm sure. And I know from those questions you were answering, I know that so many of us have experienced perhaps exercising late at night and struggling to sleep there. We know physical activity is great for sleep. We know exercise is fantastic to sleep. It reduces our time to fall asleep. It increases our deep sleep and our REM sleep, and it reduces our nighttime awakenings. And certainly through COVID and with this past year, what I have seen in our clinic is that nighttime awakenings are on the up. They're massively increasing. And I have so many people, the main complaint I see at the moment is people saying they're waking up in the middle of the night and can't get back to sleep, ruminating, having intrusive thoughts, ruminating, thinking about things they shouldn't be thinking about. And that is becoming a real big struggle. So exercising at the right time, it's a little bit like nutrition exercise. Really think about when are you exercising? Timing is key. And I know daily life can't really, you know, does dictate when we can exercise. But, you know, exercising too late at night will absolutely have the kind of converse effect on what our body is trying to do. So we know that, you know, light and dark is hugely influential on our circadian rhythm. What we know is we have a lot of uh, cells in our eyes that are there for seeing clearly, but we have a lot of cells in our eyes that are there purely to detect the absence and presence of light. And what we know is that at around four, five, six o'clock, when light starts to dim in the evenings, our body, our kind of biology starts to promote all the physiological processes that are going to help us sleep. So our body starts thinking about reducing our core blood body temperature and reducing our blood pressure and reducing our heart rate and kind of, you know, releasing a bit of muscle tension. All of those things our body is desperately trying to do for us to help us initiate and maintain sleep by exercising late at night, specifically doing something really, really, really intensive. We know that that's going to delay those things a little bit. That's going to kind of 
increase our heart rate, increase our body temperature, increase our blood pressure. It's going to do all those things that our body is desperately trying to reduce for us. So again, I wouldn't say don't exercise late at night. Some people can and some people can go and sleep like a log. That's fantastic, but be aware of it. Uh, light, light is really, really critical. So we've talked about this light and dark. Light is so disruptive to our circadian rhythm. We are seeing a, just a huge amount of circadian rhythm disorders coming into our laboratory at the moment. And I think a huge part of that is through tech and light. So I know we're all told we shouldn't be looking at our phones. We shouldn't be looking at tech. Well, why is that? Well, again, we're all told we shouldn't be looking at our phones because of the blue light. But what does that do? So what? Why shouldn't we be looking at blue light? So blue light um, massively inhibits our production of melatonin. So we think of melatonin as the sleep hormone, the hormone that makes us go to sleep. It's not, try not to think of it like that. It's a bit like the vampire hormone, some people call it. It's, it's the hormone that kind of initiates all the other processes that make us go to sleep. A recent study looked at um, looked at looking at an iPad for an hour before bed and looking at a book before bed and the impact that had on the release of our melatonin, this kind of hormone that is promoting and initiating all the processes to make us go to sleep. It was found, and this study has been replicated, there's a lot of data on this now, we know that if we're looking for tech for an hour, up to an hour, or even kind of, you know, around an hour before bed, we know that it's going to reduce the amount of melatonin that we produce by up to 50%, and it will delay the release of your melatonin by up to three hours, which has a huge impact on nighttime awakenings. If we don't have the right amount of melatonin to kind of keep us asleep, if you like, if we don't have the right amount of that hormone in our body to promote all those structures to keep us asleep, that's where we start to find interference with nighttime awakenings. We struggle to stay asleep if we don't have the right kind of hormonal balance. Equally, with that kind of that raised cortisol level, cortisol is hugely impactful in our nighttime awakenings. We're finding people with elevated stress levels, elevated course levels, can't stay asleep. And that's again, it's responsible for these nighttime awakenings that we're finding are massively kind of on the up at the moment. So, light is really, really important. I say to people, turn off half the lights at night. Um, in the house, you know, six come six o'clock, turn all the big lights off, get some dim ambient lighting. It's really, really powerful. You know, we talk about blue light being really impactful. We think of blue light being on a telephone or close to our faces. Uh, you know, it's blue light is everywhere. Blue light is in light bulbs. So really be very conscious about how much light exposure you are exposed to. Um, I'm going to, I'm conscious of time. So I'm going to touch quickly on two nutritional factors. Um, I'm going to touch on two nutritional factors that are really impactful. And certainly in terms of COVID, we're seeing a massive increase with. So as with those other things, you know, timings of exercise, timings of light, light and dark, we're finding people are staying up later into the night. People aren't exercising enough. People aren't getting as tired as much. People are staying up later into the night, looking at tech a little bit later. We're seeing circadian rhythms are shifting a little bit later. I don't know how many of you are experiencing this, but we certainly see that people are waking up later, sleeping later, waking up later. They don't have to get up and commute. So we're seeing routines are really changing. Um, in terms of <coughs> nutrition, we've touched on eating. Try and eat two to three hours before you go to bed. Give your digestive system a fighting chance to kind of really promote good sleep. But two of the kind of nutritional impacts or nutritional factors, and I put them under nutrition, that we're seeing a massive increase in, in terms of uh, COVID, is and confinement is the use of caffeine and the use of alcohol so i don't know how many of you use caffeine as a crutch or use caffeine to get you through the daytime or use caffeine as a stimulant or use caffeine to train because a lot of us do that and that's fine you know caffeine shouldn't be demonized it's absolutely fine but what's really important is that we understand how caffeine works you know not everyone is sensitive to caffeine that's absolutely fine my husband has an espresso before bed every single night sleeps like a log that's fine but what we do know and we need to understand is that caffeine has a half-life of five to six hours meaning up to you know 10 to 12 hours after you ingest your last caffeinated drink or gel or whatever you're using or pro plus it takes 10 to 12 hours for this caffeine to be leaving your system so if you're sensitive to caffeine and you find it leaves you feeling a bit kind of wired then it's really important we say i mean people say lunchtime 
we would say earlier than that you know 10 11 o'clock in the morning have your morning coffee but really think about it after that but but again it's important to understand how does caffeine work we think of caffeine as a stimulant it's not a stimulant we think of it as an accelerator something that speeds us up but it doesn't earlier i spoke about adenosine about that chemical that builds up and up and up and up throughout the day and when we cannot sustain the pressure of that chemical any longer we fall asleep what caffeine does is the caffeine molecules are very very good adenosine impersonators so if we think of this build up of adenosine like our kind of biological breaks imagine from the minute you wake up in the morning your breaks are being applied what caffeine does is it comes in and it sits in there and it blocks those breaks it blocks the build up of that tiredness if you like so these caffeine molecules function as very talented adenosine impersonators they head right for the adenosine receptors in your system and because of its similarities to adenosine it's accepted by your body as the real thing and it gets into those receptors and so but more importantly than just fitting in though the caffeine actually binds to those receptors but doesn't activate them so with those receptors blocked the brain's own stimulants can kind of do their work more freely so caffeine doesn't accelerate you if you like but it blocks those breaks so really it's fine to use it but just be aware of how it works uh, the other kind of neutral, the last nutritional, I call it nutritional kind of topic I just want to touch on is the use of alcohol. You know, alcohol and sleeping tablets. I don't know how many of you use sleeping tablets or have used sleeping tablets. Alcohol is a sedative, as is a sleeping tablet or certain type, most types. And it's often used as an aid for sleep, but consumption, it may put you to sleep faster. But your sleep quality is going to be really reduced. Sleep, um, alcohol is the most potent REM suppressor that we know of. We know one of the reasons you feel dreadful after drinking a little bit too much, uh, kind of the night before, one of the reasons is you don't really spend much time in REM sleep. You don't have that cerebral flushing mechanism. You don't get good quality sleep. Let's just put it like that. You stay in a very, very light stage of sleep as with a sleeping tablet. So you might get a good quantity, but your quality will be very, very poor. It suppresses that REM sleep and it's one of the reasons you will feel pretty grotty after 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 kind of big night out drinking or even just a couple of a couple of drinks so really be aware of the use of alcohol and sleeping tablets so that kind of use of sleeping tablets actually brings me quite nicely onto the how does a lack of sleep impact our physical performance our physical and cognitive performance well, within my research area, within the kind of the area, the field I work in, I spend a lot, all my research um, has focused on endurance um, and sport. So one of the studies I work on is the Ultra Trail du Mont Blanc. I'm sure lots of you heard of it. It's a trail race. It's 178 kilometers long with around 10,000 meters of positive ascent. And I'm responsible for running that research study. And we track runners. We follow runners around this race and it takes most of them around 40 hours to run so that's two nights out of bed so we look at the lack of we look at how that impacts them how does that impact them physically how does that impact them uh in terms of their physical performance and their cognitive performance the results are always astonishing we just we know now that a lack of sleep hugely impacts your vigilance your reaction times uh memory gait dexterity uh, not to mention kind of hallucinations. I'm sure lots of you who've done big climbs before or big, you know, kind of big, uh, big routes will have experienced that kind of that hallucination. We know now that this impact is huge. We know we have, in terms of reaction times, one night out of bed will equate to about 40% decrease in reaction times, which is critical. It's absolutely critical when we're talking about doing a technical route. Another piece of work that I've been working on recently is we're really interested in how do sleeping tablets by Matt, the use of sleeping tablets in alpinists and mountaineers living in Chamonix I'm really well placed for that and we see all the time alpinists going up the mountain maybe lots of you have done this you take a sleeping tablet you're sleeping in a hut or a refuge you need to get a good night's sleep because you need to be up at two o'clock in the morning to do a super technical route we know a lot of uh, climbers will take sleeping tablets and then what we see is this huge loss of fine motor skills dexterity decision making and it becomes a question of safety um, 
and it becomes very dangerous. And we see a lot of accidents kind of related to that kind of to those fatigue levels surrounding performance and support. When we look at our uh, decision making skills. So in our UTMB work, we'll follow those runners for two nights out of bed. So we're exhausted, frankly, by the end of it, because I spend two nights following those runners in my car, chasing them around. And we look at reaction times. We look at hallucinations. We look at what stimulants they're taking. We look at their, their uh, kind of rationale and we look at how they function. We know we have this 40% reaction reduction in reaction times. We know decision making is hugely impaired. And this can be the difference between finishing an event and not finishing an event, finishing a route or not finishing a route. You know, having that dexterity and skill to be able to complete a route hugely depends on that kind of sleep preceding. So a lot of athletes will often ask me about sleep banking. So as a general rule, sleep banking doesn't work. Uh, we can't bank sleep. You know, in our day-to-day -day lives, you can't sleep for six hours a night uh, during the week and then catch up uh, the weekends. It doesn't work like that. However, we've been involved in some great research looking at sleep banking and what we do know now, and that's how I work with a lot of athletes, is looking at how can we periodize and manage sleep prior to a big event, a big race, a big route, a big whatever it is, we look at how can we manage sleep? How can we start to periodize it and prepare in terms of when we know people are going to have a huge uh, deficit in their sleep, if we know someone's going to spend two, three, four nights out of bed, or we have people, certainly I work with a lot of rowers and sailors at the moment who are, I worked with some girls who rode the Pacific, so that was nine months of very disrupted sleep. So we'd look at how we can manage that. And certainly in terms of recovery, it's really important, you know, get that sleep as much as you can after you've um, done whatever kind of sporting, uh, if it's a route, um, then really think about that, your kind of recovery process and the sleep pre preceding whatever event you're going to do. Um, in terms of how can we sleep better? I feel like maybe we can, I mean, we're 45 minutes in now, so I don't know whether we want to kind of open up chat to talk about kind of what sleep concerns we have, but you know, certainly I've seen from the, the information that you've sent over and the, the kind of questions that people were asking is that this, this uh, lack of routine and certainly these nighttime awakenings are very, very impactful at the moment. If I can give you any advice regarding how to get good sleep, please, regularity would be the absolute number one critical, the critical key. So what I see in our clinic all the time is the, what's the first thing somebody does if they feel like they're not getting enough sleep? So if someone comes in or you think that you're tired, you think you're not getting enough sleep, the first thing you do is you spend too much time in bed. The first thing people do is they get into bed and they spend too much time there in a desperate attempt to get more sleep. And often it builds incredibly negative associations with bed, the bedroom and sleep. So think about regularity, keep to a regular night time and a regular wake up time schedule. Get up at the same time, go to sleep at the same time. We've got to give our bodies a helping hand. You know, how many of you have woken up five minutes before the alarm clock has gone off? And to a certain extent, we are training our bodies to do that. How many of you wake up feeling really groggy when you wake up really tired? That's called sleep inertia. And it's a real, uh, real, real potent thing. But what we know is if we're waking up at the wrong, wrong time, wrong part of our sleep uh, cycle, we know that can be quite impactful. That can leave us feeling worse. Using a natural alarm clock is really, really great idea. So then the alarm clock that mimics the rising of the sun. Um, use, try and think about all of those sleep hygiene issues that we see in the press all the time. Light. Is your room cool? Is it dark? Is it quiet? Those are three key things. Is it cool, dark, quiet? And are you getting regular bedtime? If all of those things are sorted, if you feel like your sleep hygiene is completely dialed in, maybe think about seeing a, a behavioral sleep specialist or go and see a GP about your sleep. Um, do we have time for me to move on to what do we do if we wake up in the middle of the night? I'm not sure, Rebecca, if you want to jump in there, but otherwise... Um, that's, that's actually one of our questions, so uh, it would be great if you could do that. <laughs> okay, so when we are working with people who are, are you insomniac, are you not? I don't know, but, uh, but these kind of nighttime awakenings start to become very habitual. Sleep is very habitual and it's very learned. You know, it's, we're like children, we get into bad habits and there's a big psychological basis. You know, the majority of people that come into my clinic, it's a psychological uh, kind of element, big psychological element to this. So what do we do? 
when we when you can't sleep well the first thing we would look at is stimulus control so what we need to look at we we use cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia but this can be used really really well um, and just in people who are finding they're waking up they can't get to sleep at night they're tossing and turning so we look at sleep disturbances and term insomnia poor sleep in three different aspects we look at you can't get to sleep you can't stay asleep so you're waking up you know in the middle of the night and lying there for two hours and not can't get back to sleep or you're waking up really early in the morning and you can't get back to sleep so those are the kind of three main aspects and cognitive behavioral therapy works really well for all of those so the first thing we do is we look at stimulus control we'd look at we're aiming at, we're aiming to shift the negative associations of the bed and the bedroom with not sleeping towards a positive association with good quality sleep so it, it implies amongst other things not using the bed for anything other than sleep or intimacy and that's really really important as i said we see, tend to find people who don't sleep very well people who are waking up and lying there for hours at night tend to go to bed too early and their sleep efficiency is very poor so i suspect many of us will get into bed and we'll look at a phone look at a book look at an email look at uh you know and this is where sleep procrastination comes in it's a real big problem because how many of us get into bed thinking I'm really tired, I'm just ready for bed now, but I'll just check. And 40 minutes later, we're still scrolling through absolute nonsense. So that's really important. The bed should be for sleep and intimacy and nothing else. So that's the first kind of key. And that starts to build that association between sleep and bed. A lot of us have this kind of real negative association now with bed is anxiety, bed is frustration, bed is not sleeping, bed is, and we, the real important thing is to kind of break that association. So if you're in bed and you haven't just fallen asleep, what do you do? If you are awake for more than 15 minutes, and this is really important, and it's an absolute non-negotiable in our sleep clinic, if you're awake for more than 15 minutes, and again, as part of sleep hygiene, I wouldn't really want you looking at a clock or having a clock facing you, but if you're awake for more than 15 minutes, 15 minutes roughly, or you, there comes a point where you think, that's it, I'm awake, this is ridiculous, or there's a point where you start to get frustrated and irritated and miserable in bed, we ask you to get up. It's really important to get up and leave the bedroom and only return to bed when you are sleepy or after 30 minutes, whichever comes first. And this is an incredibly hard thing to do, I know, but a bit of planning goes a long way. So think about where are you going to go? Have a hot flask of tea, have a blanket, have a dressing gown, have a book, have everything ready. What this does is we start to build the association between bed is for sleep, awake and irritation is not for the bed. It's a very powerful technique that works really well. So stimulus control, Bed is for sleep and intimacy. And if you're for awake for more than 15 minutes, roughly, it's critical you get up and leave that bedroom and go back a little bit later when you're feeling sleepy. We look at sleep hygiene in cognitive behavioral therapy. So that refers to ensuring bright light exposure during the day, um, but not at night, um, to enhance your kind of sleep inducing melatonin production. Don't drink caffeine in the evening, reduce your alcohol intake, you know, not exercising immediately or kind of prior to bedtime. Avoid clock watching it in the night. First thing I'd say is get the phone out of the bedroom, get the clock, turn the clock around so you can't see it. You know, removing bright lights is really important and ensuring that kind of optimal room and body temperature. You know, we need, to, our bodies need to be around two degrees lower to initiate and to maintain sleep. So temperature is really important. So, okay, you've woken up and, um, so hang on, before we wake up, before we go to bed, something else that we really, really, uh, advocate is using a cognitive control diary and I can share that with Rebecca I can share that with you the one that I use for my clients but really I talk about it like putting the day to bed before you go to bed so many of us wake up in the middle of the night and start ruminating about you know what we've got to do the next day what's happened the day that's just passed about the to-do list we've got we get negative intrusive thoughts and what we really ask patients to do is get rid of all of that so before you go to bed use a journal a journal with a cover that you can close is really important it's really symbolic you're closing it at the end of this take 45 minutes to empty your mind what have you done today and I can share the four topping headings that we use but really what have you done today what have you got to do tomorrow what have you put in place to deal with tomorrow 
um, really emptying your mind, writing all that down and then put that journal next to your bed. So if you wake up in the middle of the night with a burning thing on your to-do list, you can write it down and get it out of your mind. So you go to bed and this is marvellous. You've now got everything out of your mind before you go to bed. You go to sleep um, and you wake up in the middle of the night and feel like you can't get back to sleep. What do you do then? Well, hopefully you've got nothing to think about or you've got nothing intrusive or nothing. You're not ruminating about too much because you've written it all down in your cognitive control diary. But then what do we need? We then need to give and we share like again, I can share these with uh, Rebecca to kind of distribute to you. But we use cognitive distraction techniques. And it's really important to find what works for you. What works for you probably wouldn't work for me. Um, but we look at, um, you can do anything you want, but it's look, fundamentally it's using distraction. If you want to listen to a podcast, if you want to, and that's going to make you fall asleep, that's great. If you, there's loads of breathing exercises that we can give you, meditation, there is, there's all sorts of cognitive distractions, phonemic fluency and semantic fluency. There's all sorts of different cognitive distraction techniques. And it's really about trying those. But the critical thing is to remove all of those negative, negative thoughts before you go to bed. Use that cognitive control diary. Use stimulus control. And try not to go to bed too early. Um, are probably the three top tips when, when people are really kind of in the thick of um, a really serious kind of um, insomnia kind of. Uh, crisis if you like or they're really insomniac or really struggling with nighttime awakenings we then would move on to using sleep rescheduling and we completely change the pattern of sleep and thereby what we do is we look at sleep efficiency so we'll look at how much time are you in bed versus how much time are you asleep so your sleep efficiency would be a hundred percent if you were in bed for seven hours and you were asleep for seven hours but what we find is this the difference between these two uh, numbers is becoming greater so many of us will be in bed for 10 hours because we think we're really tired so we need to go to bed but we'll probably only sleep for about six hours because we'll spend time tossing and turning and not falling asleep so what we need to do is make those two figures become a little bit more in line and by doing by by using sleep rescheduling is is a really powerful tool for that but uh, you know i could i could share thoughts around that and how to do that at a later date but it's um best to do that with uh, the guidance of an expert I'd say because it can be quite intense so yeah so that's hopefully that helps amazing thank you um we we've got a big thumbs up and yes please to to those resources so um yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch and I'll send those around to everybody um some questions um and I'll, I'll try and consolidate them in groups so it's a bit easier <laughs> um but quite a few about hormone levels the menstrual cycle why is it that sometimes sleep is quite disturbed before somebody starts their period? Um, have you got any insights into that? Uh, yes, there are certain kind of, um, yes, there are certain gynecological conditions. There are certain periods in which, so just before we get our period, we change our absorption and release of melatonin. There are certain conditions like PMDD. Uh, there are certain conditions that we know that re release of melatonin is absolutely, it's almost it's completely minimal. Um, so then, then we would work with people to kind of substitute and kind of give uh, kind of medical grades at melatonin. Incidentally, please don't buy melatonin over the counter. It's, uh, it's a placebo, it's hopeless. Um, and lots of people use melatonin as, as, a, as, a, as a sleeping tablet, but that's not how it works. So uh, please don't use it like that. But in terms of our menstrual cycle, we know at different times of the month, our release and absorption and the amount of, uh, kind of melatonin we release is very different. So that kind of impacts our sleep. We also know that in terms of thermal regulation around the, uh, the, you know, throughout our kind of menstrual cycle, we know that thermal regulation temperature is a massive issue. So when I said earlier, we have to reduce that kind of our body temperature by up to two degrees to initiate and maintain sleep. A lot of women really struggle with that. And that goes for that kind of the, the peri, perimenopausal among us or the postmenopausal among us we know thermal regulation can be quite an issue obviously you know we're all familiar with this kind of hot flushes but that can be really impactful with sleep um so there's lots we can do for that um there's lots there's lots of devices that are great i don't know if anyone suffers with heat you can use chili pads are brilliant so like a heated blanket you can now get a cooling blanket you can get disposable ones that you put under your mattress that cool the bed down to about 10 degrees which is pretty chilly so if anyone suffers with heat then they're a great option as well. 
Fantastic. And then um, sort of following up on the, the supplements, um, obviously not buying melatonin over the counter, um, but a, a question on what you think about herbal sleeping tablets and what kind of supplements might be helpful to people. There's only one. There is only one uh, herbal remedy or supplement that has absolutely got any science behind it. That's valerian root. So you can take valerian root in a tea, you can take it in a capsule. Um, often you'll find it mixed with something else. Try and get it pure so you can get it from Holland Barrett. That is the only one that is scientifically has any science behind it. Your other ones, if they work, listen, if they work and you think they work, they're great. I would be pretty confident in saying they're all a placebo. Uh, there's not much science behind any of them. But if they work, that's fine. They won't do you any harm. Valerian root is the only one that's got any science behind it really and that one really is very effective so if you're looking for something natural to use then use that um it's great fantastic and then then people talking about sleep patterns so um mm. shift workers um and also do, does it matter when you sleep or is it how much sleep um was the the kind of urban legends about the the sleep quality before midnight is better yeah. um no <laughs> <laughs> that is an urban legend yeah the, what that's referring to is like i was saying the proportion of sleep changes throughout the night so actually the longer you're asleep the more deep sleep and REM sleep you get one gets so we tend to feel more refreshed once we've had a lot a big chunk of deep sleep and REM sleep but no it's nothing to do with before midnight or after midnight it's to do with the quantity of sleep so if it's eight hours sleep the last five hours of that eight hours is going to be a little bit more refreshing and restorative that's all that is. Uh, in terms of shift work, it's a really difficult one because it's, it, you know, we don't adapt to shift work. We adapt to jet lag. So we've all experienced having our kind of our rhythm knocked out a little bit, but then we adapt to it. We can't adapt to shift work. Um, and it's not very good for us. There are ways we can better manage it. There are certainly tools and, and, and there's certainly things I can share to help those shift workers amongst you but we don't adapt very well to it and we can't. So, but there's, there's certain tools and resources I can share to help with that, absolutely. Uh, but it's definitely a tricky one. Tricky Fantastic. One. And for those who have trouble getting up in the morning, is, is that an indicator that the quality of sleep has been too low? Yeah, possibly. So if you have really struggled getting up in the morning, first thing I think, are you sleep deprived? So a, a huge problem we have at the moment is people don't give themselves the opportunity to get eight hours sleep. You know, a lot of people will say to me, oh, I'm so tired, I'm so tired, I go to bed at one o'clock in the morning and get up at six. And I'm like, well, you know, you have to give yourself. So first of all, are you getting enough sleep is really important. Um, are, you, are you giving yourself the opportunity? If you are giving yourself the opportunity, you are getting what you deem to be a good amount of sleep. You're waking up naturally, you're falling asleep well, you feel like you don't have too many nighttime awakenings. Incidentally, nighttime awakenings are normal. A lot of people worry that they wake up at night. It's absolutely normal to wake up. When it becomes a problem is when we are awake for an extended period of time. So if you are awake, if you feel like you're getting enough sleep or you have the opportunity, do you have the opportunity to sleep do you sleep pretty much through the night? Okay, you may have five or 10 minutes here or there that you're up. You may need to get up and use the bathroom. That's absolutely fine. But you're still waking up feeling really very tired. Then I would look at, does it pass? Is that just sleep inertia? Are you waking up at the wrong time of your sleep cycle? Are you using an alarm clock? Because we tend to feel pretty awful when we use an alarm clock. Um, does it pass? Uh, after an hour, are you feeling okay? Are you feeling absolutely fine? Or after half an hour, do you feel fine? Then I wouldn't worry about it. If you have extreme kind of levels of daytime fatigue and sleepiness, if you know, but it's really impacting your quality of life and your daily functioning, the fact that you're so tired in the morning, then I would recommend that you go and see a GP. You go and see someone and get assessed for your sleep because that's not usual. If you're sleeping enough and you're sleeping pretty much all night, you shouldn't feel exhausted in the morning. 
Um, we've got some really interesting um, questions about dealing with light. Um, so one, one example, living very much in, in the north of the Northern Hemisphere with 18 hour long days and it never really gets dark in the summer and finding it really difficult to regulate light yeah. even with blackout blinds and eye shades. Um, apart from sleeping in a cupboard, could you uh, recommend any strategies for that? <laughs> It is really hard. I mean, it's like, it is really hard. We say for people, you know, if you're living with extreme amounts of daylight, you know, up, you know, if in kind of Northern Sweden or Lapland or wherever you are, you know, the obvious using absolute blackout blinds, um, we recommend shutting all the curtains, blackout lines from about six o'clock in the evening. It sounds <coughs> ridiculous. Using amber lens glasses really important not sunglasses like <laughs> i do have people who like to wear sunglasses but you know they're better than nothing but amber lens glasses are really great at promoting uh, uh melatonin release of melatonin shut all the curtains shut all the shutters using an eye patch uh, using kind of sorry um an eye mask is really important um using a you know using a light box and a dim box is really can be really useful um, it's a tricky one. It is really hard. Um, trying to block out as much light as absolute possible, but from doing it from a lot earlier in the evening is really important. It's no good. What is really key with this is not thinking, okay, it's 10 o'clock at night. Now I'm going to shut the blinds. You, you know, it's really important to start the process from, I'd say from about six o'clock in the evening, you know, unless you're whatever, having a barbecue or something, but really starting that as early as possible, start that process will make a big difference. So timing is key in terms of kind of making things dark but yeah it's tricky right and then in, in terms of um light and melatonin is it is it purely wavelength dependent or is is there a sort of an aspect of whole spectrum brightness as well um and then a follow-up question of do the do the phone filters for reducing brightness and blue actually work <laughs> yeah it's a so blue light there is a range of spectrum that's relevant and <sighs> And that's why kind of it's a bit of a misconception that we always think that phone, you know, having it's on a phone, an iPad, a computer, they're the kind of most detrimental things. And they are because proximity is really important. So how close you are to the screen is really important. So watching a TV across the room is nowhere near as bad in terms of blue light exposure or light exposure than, you know, lying in bed, looking your phone this close to your face. And what we forget is that the blue light is everywhere. The big light, the kind of ambient lights, natural light daylight all has blue light in it so when we have people who are incredibly sensitive to circadian rhythm disorders or phase delays or kind of movements or we're trying to move someone's circadian rhythm back or forwards a little bit we use those amber lens glasses so using those um wrap around amber filtered glasses that are like 10 pounds on on amazon are incredibly potent they just work unbelievably well so yes that 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 filter on your phone the night mode on, on iPhones does work, absolutely. But, you know, there are other things that could be better. There's a, there's a software called Flux, F kind of dot L-U-X, which you can download onto any kind of device, which works really well. But again, but again, it's not just about that one device or that one that one thing you're using. It's about all the ambient light. So really, if you want to go really hardcore on it, I would massively recommend the amber amber lens wraparound glasses work brilliantly well, brilliantly well. And they massively will reduce nighttime awakenings. It don't look very cool, but we're all in lockdown, so it doesn't matter. This is going to be the next trend for climbers. We're, we're going to start oh, it here. <laughs> I tell you, I, honestly, you'd be amazed. You, we may laugh, but you will be amazed the difference it makes. If you start wearing them about six o'clock in the evening, it's it's unbelievable. But yeah, it doesn't look cool, so not many people want to <laughs> <laughs> it's all right if there's enough of us yeah. um thoughts on sleep music so uh again there's kind of the the whole max richter opus and then uh, lots of specially designed things on on youtube and a lot of the wellness apps if they work fine it's not going to reduce your quality of sleep it's not going to reduce your quantity as long as you're not using headphones and you don't garrot yourself in the middle of the night with headphones wrapped around your head and it's fine. I mean, there's a little bit of debate. There's, there is debate around the science of to, as to if you are listening to it, if you're exposed to I mean, presumably you're using it on a timer and it turns off after whatever, 10, 15, 20 minutes. That's better. There's a little bit of argument to say that um, something noise playing all night does disrupt the quality of our sleep. Absolutely. 
I'm in two minds. I just think, you know, if it, if it, if it helps you get off to sleep and you sleep all night, then there are worse things to be doing. Is there much science behind how good they are? No, but if they work, they work. So I wouldn't worry about it if you need to use it. Definitely not. Lovely. Um, for those who are on the higher end of sleep numbers needed sort of nine hours, um, mm -hmm. is it possible to see signs of sleep deprivation already if they reduce that to eight hours? Is it is it that kind of increment based on somebody's needs? Yeah, I mean, it, to a certain extent, yes. You know, if you have someone who genuinely really, really feels like they can't function on less than kind of nine hours sleep, yeah, you just have that person reduced to seven and a half hours will start to see or feel, you know, that, that cognitive impact of to sleep deprivation. You probably wouldn't, you wouldn't be seeing, seeing the physical and the hormonal impact. You wouldn't be seeing that kind of long-term chronic um, damage or impact but certainly the cognitive impact would be very real for someone who really does need a lot of sleep. Yeah, absolutely. But we wouldn't be so worried about the, um, the physical impact and the long-term damage for someone like that. Thoughts on power naps. Great. Look, if you can power nap and then you can go to sleep at an, an appropriate time at night, then that's great. If you are power napping, but then can't get to sleep until midnight, I would suggest you don't need the nap. If you can power nap and then go to bed at a reasonable time, absolutely great. They're called power naps. You know, we all know we typically shouldn't be sleeping if it's a power nap for more than 20 to 30 minutes. That's to stop you getting into that deep, deep sleep in that kind of latest, the latter stages of a sleep cycle, thereby meaning you shouldn't feel groggy and, you know, all lethargic and have a big kind of a high level of sleep inertia when you wake up. However, I would caveat that with saying if you are, if you need a sleep, a nap to get through the day, if you are someone that absolutely needs one, then I would suggest something else is going on. Nobody should need a nap to get through the day. So if it's an occasional thing, great, carry on. If it's something that you are dependent on, that's not usual. And perhaps go and see your doctor and chat about that because you shouldn't. And perhaps you're, you're restricting your sleep too much at night. Perhaps you need to go to bed a bit earlier, get more sleep at night, and then you won't need that nap in the day. But if it's occasional, great. Absolutely. Yeah. That's probably something that we can uh, all start to have a go at when we're in these slightly more flexible working patterns that we're in at the moment. <laughs> yeah, and that's a big thing. You know, I found that a lot of people are very flexible. People are just quite lethargic. People are stuck at home. So they're napping. You know, napping is the biggest is really detrimental to sleep it's really detrimental you know we often find people are napping and then they're and then they're up you know with extended periods of nighttime wakening at night well stop the napping is the first thing stop napping absolutely is the first thing to do there you talked a bit earlier about um sort of exercising close to bedtime um and there's a question here about adrenaline and sleep um is it something that can sort of push you over the edge and actually build up long term to have a, a negative effect? Is it a bad pattern? Uh, yeah, it, it can be a bad pattern. If you're never giving your body the time to 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 reduce that cortisol level, to reduce those ad 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 adrenaline levels. It, it, yeah, it can be, you know, it can it just it just is compounded every day. You know, you're just constantly playing catch up hormonally and physically. Um, yeah, so it can. It's you know, if we if we never if we're if that cortisol level is nice and high in the morning, and then it's meant to come down nice and low before bedtime, but we're never quite getting it down low because we're constantly exercising and you know keeping that cortisol and adrenaline nice and high. We just we're always starting off from a higher level. We're never quite, you know, we're always starting off on the back foot, and it does. Yeah, it absolutely can be compounded. You know, we know prolonged exposure to excessive amounts of cortisol in the system can be very damaging physically, not just, you know, forget sleep, but in terms of a whole other host of physical kind of implications, it can be very damaging. So it's important to kind of pay attention to that occasionally. Incidentally, we do know that if you do exercise uh, at 60% uh, less, less of your max heart rate, um, that actually reduces cortisol levels. So if you really want to exercise at night, try and do something that's 60% or less of your maximum heart rate and you'll be doing yourself a favor so but often lots of us don't want to do that we want to exercise hard so maybe think about the intensity of what you're doing if you have to exercise late
And really interesting, actually, for there's, there's been so much interest in, in this group to to be looking at training plans and training towards goals and, and actually beginning to bring all of this together holistically with Rebecca's nutrition tips, etc. To start building those really good holistic patterns, I think, is something we can take the time to do right now when we can't necessarily do anything else. Um, we've still got quite a few questions but I'm very mindful of the time and actually um, I, I think we probably will have lots of interest for uh, a further webinar so um, we'll talk to you about that a little bit later. Yeah. Um, no, look happy to do a more specific one you know if we want a training and sleep or a ex you know yeah we can do a more specific one later on. That would be amazing um, probably just one last question then how do you know you've had enough good quality sleep? How do you know if you need a look? Now, this is something that always I, I always get asked this. And I always think, right, so when you wake up in the morning, are you sleeping enough? Do you need an alarm clock to get out of bed? Like if I if I put you on a desert island, what time would you wake up? What time, you know, do you are you waking up at the kind of natural time? So do you need an alarm clock to get out of bed? Does it take you ages to wake up in the morning? Do you need stimulants to get you through the day? Do you rely on caffeine, nicotine, alcohol? Let's look at your mood. Are you grumpy? Are you irritable? Are you moody? Like, are you grumpy throughout the day? Do you lack concentration? Do people tell you you look tired? Which incidentally, Rebecca told me I look tired today, actually. So I'm bone to pick with her. Um, but, you know, it's all of those really obvious things. Like, do you, you know, we all know, I think we really do know if we're getting enough sleep or not. And if any of those things ring true, are you struggling to get out of bed? Are you struggling to function throughout the day? Are you... You know, are you exhausted by the end of the day? Are you a nodding dog on the sofa? All of those things indicate, you know, one glaringly obvious thing is that you're probably not getting enough sleep. So, yeah, got to be a scientist of yourself and uh, figure it out. Thank you so much, Charlotte. That was absolutely fantastic. I think you can tell by the volume of questions and um, some fantastic comments in the chat that that's a really great first first insight into something that people really care about but haven't given enough thought to. And actually, it's a, a really key part of, of seeing ourselves as athletes and, and how to just even manage our normal lives. So um, thank you so much. We'll, we'll definitely be in touch about a follow up. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, and to 510 and added us for for making this possible um, we love having you guys as part of this community and seeing the same names um, coming to lots of different things we hope that you're like us beginning to start to put these pieces together uh, and that when we're all released from our homes there will be something to bring from these times that will will help us to move forward in a, in a really good way bye bye, bye.